right, what is going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Chasing Waypoints podcast. All right, a little bit different flair there. So, we are back. <laughs> We're actually back and forth. Talk about a crazy week we've been having, but we are well underway. Looks like we've got a uh, final countdown for the Revzilla Ride On ADB Fest. Uh, you guys will be hearing this episode a little bit later tonight. We are recording this uh, right now, 6.30 Pacific Standard Time. And we've got another In the Bivouac for you guys tonight. With none other than Simon Edwards. So a mutual friend of ours, Jared, from Kota Rally, or Kota Rally participant, and now Rally Racer, uh, said, hey, you got to talk to this guy. He's done a bunch of cool stuff. And he said, yes, absolutely, we do got to do that. So had a quick conversation with him and talked a little bit about uh, what he's been up to and then also like checked out some of the videos and some of the stuff that he has done. And I said, well, yes, we should absolutely get him on the show and talk a little bit about Rally. So in the meantime, while I am messaging him the link right now, uh, let's talk about Rally Raid happenings. We have the Baja Rally slash American Rally Originals fundraiser uh, coming up here in May, not too far away now, May 21st, 22nd, if I remember correctly. And then we are going to be moving right back into, uh, let's see, Kota Rally after that. We've got the Nora Rally coming up in 11 days, so that's going to be interesting. Uh, going full on road book, then we'll talk to Simon about that. That's going to be something that he's going to be running. Uh, and then also... Man, there's everything going on right on ADV Fest this this uh, this coming week. Actually, leaving Friday morning, super early, bright and early, and then from there going to be heading heading back, and then getting ready to head to Ensenada, spend some downtime, maybe doing some rides and that kind of stuff. But uh, but we will see. Anyway, let's turn the uh, let's turn the party down and see what's what's happening here so yeah so we got a lot going on it has been a busy week trying to get both bikes ready i have the 850 rented out on the week that i am going to be going to uh the ride on adb fest and then also have um have to get the 790 ready so that thing's been a project and a half the raid garage kit the counter shocks uh front suspension uh dampener component uh the super secret device uh and then also Let's see, what else have we done to that thing? The ride kit. Of course, we have the uh, Rottweiler Performance, uh, the extra tank on that thing. So definitely getting some uh, some extra mileage. I'm happy to report that we've got back. Uh, basically, lost a half a gallon uh, with the Raid Garage tanks up front, but gained it back and a gallon uh, by going with the Rottweiler rear tank uh, down the center of the frame rail. So Got that thing mounted up, kind of did a makeshift mount for the time being for my rear tail light. I do run the uh, Rottweiler uh, fender eliminator with their license plate that lights up as well with all the brake stop, go left, right turn, all of that stuff. So I was able to get that mounted onto it. And then um, and now we're just down to test riding on the recommendation from uh, Travis over at Every Single Sunday uh, and uh, my 1090R on uh, Instagram or at 1090R. We were able to get uh, Randy. Uh, said, hey, you know, Tusk uh, D-Sport rear with the uh, 216 fatty front. And uh, so that's what I'm going to be rocking. Uh, this is the first for me, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time I've actually mixed tire brands on a motorcycle. Uh, I don't know. It's just my OCD didn't allow me to do that before. And so, um, you know, OK, so the adventure mullet, that's a whole nother thing, right? We're, we're OK with the adventure mullet. And that's basically running a knobby up front with a, uh, you know, basically an all-terrain tire in the rear. Uh, and, it, you know, it works really well. You got a bike with a lot of horsepower and traction control. You know, it, it does its job. But, you know, there's not a lot you can do as far as the front end washing out. So you want something that's a little bit more aggressive uh, and that that's going to handle that. So. Uh, that's what I've been running on that setup, uh, or that's what I've run on previous bikes. But now on this one, uh, I'm coming from a set of Anarchy Wilds to now the D Sport rear with a uh, with that uh, Shinko fatty front up front. So we'll see how it works. I mean, that tire looks beef. You know, that ninety what is it? Uh, ninety wide, hundred uh, percent 
sidewall on that thing or aspect ratio uh, for all of those that you know tire sizes uh, metric tire sizes the first is width in millimeters or cross section in millimeters and then the second number is a ratio or, or a percentage so 100 being 100 percent of the 90 uh, 90 90 being 90 percent of the 90 uh, 80, 90 or 90, 80, whatever it is. The second number is always the, the perspective, unless you're talking about standard tires, then, uh, 31, 10, 50, 15, that is a 31 inch tall tire, uh, 20 or 10, 50, 10 and a half inches wide with a 15 inch wheel. Uh, so that's kind of how that, that works. But, uh, we don't do that in uh, motorcycles for the most part. We're on the metric system there. So anyway, if you didn't know, well, now, you know, uh, so let's see what else we got going on. We've got that. We've got the bike ready. Uh, GS, we've got uh, big happenings, uh, actually. First first episode, I am mentioning this, but we have uh, Moscow Moto coming on board uh, and, and helping and contributing to the podcast. Uh, both we're going to be trying some of their gear out on the uh, 850 and the 790 uh, and coming soon, Project 501. Uh, we're going to be... I'm stoked to see because I'm a bit of a, first of all, I have a ton of bags, um, not motorcycle related stuff, but just bags in general. Um, and so I'm looking forward to getting it dialed in and, and, you know, basically everything has its set of bags and I know where everything is because the worst thing you can start doing is pulling tool bags from one bike to put into another. And then, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to put in the KTM tools and the two tools that I need for the KTM, uh, from the BMW kit or, you know, it just turns into a mess. So, uh, I'm looking forward to getting, getting this thing dialed in. And so I'm waiting for those literally drop in tomorrow. I'm stoked to get them on for the event, uh, coming up at the end of, uh, end of this week already. So it's, it's coming by uh, or coming up pretty fast, uh, for that one. So going to be doing that. We'll talk more about those bags and all of that stuff. But in the meantime, it looks like uh, we have uh, Simon on the line. Simon, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, hey, what's going on, sir? Not much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you for making some time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Believe me. I know. I know you've got uh, you've got some prep and some stuff going on, right? Yeah, we're getting ready for uh, the Nora Mexican 1000 here in 11 days. So, uh, been getting tires and mooses mounted and packing finalized and all the detail work. Ah, yes. All, all the fun stuff. How, uh, yeah. what, uh, what tires do you run? I was literally just talking. Tires. Uh, I'm running Kenda Parker DTs oh, okay. with Mitchell and mooses. Gotcha. All right. Uh, what, what loop do you use on the mooses? Um, I'm, I'm using just the, the Michelin, the Michelin stuff. uh, silicone stuff that they give with them. Ah, gotcha. I usually double up on it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I of course run rim locks, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, mostly that's for expense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I I can usually run uh, in two sets of wheels and tires for the whole event. Mm-hmm. Nice. Well, that's that's actually not that bad because uh, no. yeah, tires <laughs> tires and particularly mooses get pretty expensive, especially if you're melting them out of there. Yeah, so. definitely a significant expense. And I've had I've had failures with other products in the past in the Nora. So I'm, I'm pretty leery about what I use. If it works, I just stay with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And especially if you're trusting it to go out into the middle of nowhere. So yeah, exactly. (laughs) You you want to make sure it's dialed. And it's funny how everybody has their own secret recipe for moose juice. You know, they, (laughs) uh, absolutely. And, and everybody you ask has got a different opinion. And, And one of the reasons I mount new tires, even if they've, you know, the new tires and mooses is just because you get such criticism at the start line. Really? You're going to run those? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they look like they got 60 miles on them. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, that would be correct. <laughs> You're not running new ones? No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, they've been properly scrubbed in and, you know, heat cycled appropriately and blah, blah, yeah. blah. <laughs> yeah. So I know, I know there's some land speed stuff and we're, gonna, we're definitely going to talk about that. Um, yeah. But... Tell me a little bit about, so is this your first time running Nora? No, this will be my, uh, my seventh Nora 1000, I think. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've done one 506 1000s. Nice. All right. And so the question that I've been curious, and you're the first one I asked this is, what do you think about this change going to road books? 
Oh, I think it's, uh, I think the motivation is for safety. I think Nora's trying to force all the riders to, to pay attention to the, to, to the, the hazards that are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not hundred percent convinced this is the way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody's always been given the road book and the opportunity to review it. Some people pay more attention to it than others. Mm-hmm. I think going away completely from GPS as well uh, makes it more difficult for amateurs to get involved mm-hmm. in desert racing. Mm-hmm. Formally, you could you could download the the route on your phone and run it with your phone if you elected to. It wouldn't be the smartest idea. Yeah. Um, I think going to all road book navigation has definitely upped the pedigree in the event. Mm-hmm. When you look at the list of entrants coming into the event now, mm-hmm. there are some people who have some significant background. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and I think that's going to, that's going to make the competition a lot stiffer. Mm-hmm. Well, it, you know, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely going to make it interesting for sure. I mean, the, the thing that I, I, you know, I see it and, and, and you're right, you know, the entry barrier, right. A lot of people are intimidated, uh, by the road book more so not because it's a road book, but the fact that I don't have a backup. If I get lost, if I get whatever, you know, I don't have a way of, you know, but there are, you know, with, with the devices and stuff like that, you'll like, you'll see there's, there's ways to find yourself, you know, you're not completely lost. And then somebody else is coming along, you know, or, you know, we're in the road book, but, um, I, I kind of like the idea. Like, I feel like it's kind of tough because I feel like it was short notice for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Oh Um, Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, how much uh, have you written road books before? I mean, is this something that you've done before? Or? Yeah, kind of um, uh, the last uh, two or three NORs that I've run, I've intentionally run a, a roll chart road book holder with a GPS backup just to get the experience. Cool. One of the reasons I, I did it was because I, I have interest in in rally raid um, races, especially with the Kotar rally coming up here in October mm-hmm. or sorry, September. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an opportunity to get, to get roll chart and road book experience with a GPS backup. Mm-hmm. That was really the only place you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. That is, I mean, yeah, the, the events now and the training and stuff like that. Yeah. They're, we've got more of them, but they don't necessarily line up in accordance with, you know, what, what events you're trying to do and that kind of stuff. So that's good. So you've done right, I mean, exactly. You're not walking in super cold into this. And no, I, I feel I, I went to uh, the Sonora Rally puts on a, a navigation school before mm-hmm. their event. I went to that event once, um, and like I said, I've used the roll chart uh, pr- pretty much exclusively in the 500 Nora 500 back in October, and and had really good success with it. It's definitely a learned um, skill, but it's, it's, it doesn't take very long to, to pick it up. Yeah. And getting started in it. So, I mean, it sounds like a handful of road books. What if, um, are there some things you learn? like maybe somebody that's, that's this Nora 1000 is going to be their first time behind a road book. Is there something that you might share to, to calm the nerves? Uh, <laughs> um, slow down. I think slow down, take your time. Um, Jimmy, the Nora organization and Jimmy Lewis have done a really good, uh, online training course Mm -hmm. that the, the organization is requiring everybody to do really pay attention to that. Um, they have a great final test that, that qualifies everybody to be in the event. That's a great opportunity. They've even, um, gotten rally navigator to help us with, uh, um, being able to build your own roll charts Mm -hmm. from home. Uh, which is a great opportunity. Uh, just, sp- you know, the, all those things add up. And then I think just slowing down during the actual event and just being comfortable with your riding and, and taking the opportunity to go a little bit slower and mm-hmm. pay attention to the navigation. Yeah. You can't really do both. You can't re- navigate and race. No. And I've, I've seen people uh, with my time at Baja rally, I've seen people try and do it and it does not work out. No, <laughs> no. There, there, there's a handful, unless it's like Brabeck, Howes, Klein, 
uh, <laughs> you know, and even yeah. those guys, you know, they, they, they recognize, and you can see it in their road books, the way that they mark the road book. They're like, ah, this is their reminder to slow down and navigate, you know? Right. So, and, and the race organizer, uh, Eliseo Garcia has been very adamant that he understands that for most of us in the Nora, this is going to be one of our first times as with just roll chart navigation. So gotcha. they're not going to make it overly complicated. I think it will get progressively more difficult as in the following years, but they've done, I think, a very good job of uh, recognizing that this is going to be new for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, that's huge. Oh, I, you know, yeah, I support the, I support the decision because I think that this is going to foster in a different type of safety. Now it's no longer about who can hold it pinned the longest. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's now it's a chess game. Now it's, you've got every, literally every waypoint is an opportunity to blow it and, and lose any kind of lead you gain by, you know, doing 90 miles an hour where you should have been doing 50. Exactly. Exactly. So, and, it's, it's definitely going to be a, a thinking man's race. Yeah. And I've seen, and I mean, we've, we've seen it in multiple rallies, but we've seen, you know, I've personally experienced it, uh, between, uh, Burgess and Udall at one of the Baja rallies. It's, it was the classic, the tortoise and the hare. And, right. and it was literally decided at the last waypoint, you know, and, and on a navigation error. So that's, I mean, that, that sums it up. So I think, you know, I think it'll definitely be, it'll be interesting. I think this first year is going to be a little rough for a lot of people, but I think, uh, it sounds like you've kind of prepped and done it right. I, well, I, I hope so. Yeah. You know, they, I, I can't remember who said it, but down in Baja, you either win or you learn. I've been doing a lot of learning. So. <laughs> That is a great way of putting that. <laughs> no bad days. <laughs> no. Only lessons. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I, I just uh I just heard today that Jimmy Lewis and Ricky Brabeck had just uh uh pre ran the whole thing and qualified the course and they any errors that were on it have been corrected and um so they they had they had a good opinion of the course. So Yeah. Yeah, I that heard says a lot. I, I saw the updates and I saw that they were out there running and I was like, yeah, they didn't really say what they were doing, but I was like, yeah, I know what you guys are doing. <laughs> yeah. So no, it'll be uh, I mean that that's, that's awesome. And I mean, and that's, we've talked about it at a lot of rallies, you know, that's always the thing is like, it's oh, the, the person giving the directions, right. Creating the road book has a certain mindset and a certain way they like things. And you know, this is obvious to me. Mm -hmm. but the problem is, is you got 50, 60 other racers behind you that that is not so obvious. So getting extra eyes on it, especially from somebody, you know, like Ricky Brabeck, who's ran like three road books in his life, um, to actually go down and run these and, and get, you know, get another perspective from somebody that's literally won the Dakar and Jimmy Lewis, yeah. who's trained so many Dakar athletes and then also raced it, you know, that's, I'm sure probably I, a little I, comforting. I think getting, Jimmy's opinion because he he teaches he teaches this to beginners. Mm -hmm. He he has a perspective of what the beginners are gonna need. Mm -hmm. And I think that's gonna be super valuable. Yeah. Very very true. I mean, yeah. I it, think the organization did a great service to the riders and, and including those guys for sure. Mhm. Mm and getting in, getting them involved. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So, chasing waypoints we normally talk about. It. So, let's talk about some different waypoints that you've okay. done other achievements and other things. So, uh, let's go back to going really fast on motorcycles. Uh, yeah. how did, how did that land speed thing come about? What, what was, what got you into it? And well, um, I, I, uh, I started out my desert career in I think 2005 or 2006 with the Baja 500, mm -hmm. um, after seeing, uh, um, dust the glory, right? Like everybody was interested in yes. said, oh, I can go do that. And so I entered my first off-road race ever in the Baja 500. And, um, my brother who was racing with me crashed out and broke his leg and, you know, it took us 13 hours to get out of the desert and two days to drive home and all of that. And, and he, well, he didn't have the greatest experience. I had a blast. <laughs> and, and while, while we were kind of waiting for him to heal, mm -hmm. um, I read a ma magazine article about Chris Carr was going to try to break the the then, the then time land speed record of 350 miles an hour at Bonneville. And I thought, well, you know, let's, let's go out and see that. Let's go watch that. And then I found out that um, the Bonneville motorcycle speed trials had a run what you brung class where you could take your commuter bike and safety wire it 
and uh, put it on the salt and see what you could do. I thought, well, we're going to be out there, and I'm not a very good spectator. So uh, three of us rode out there and safety wired our bikes and jumped on the salt. And uh, I took my R100 GS Perry Dakar and raced it on the salt and did a blistering 93 miles an hour oh, man. and had a blast. And, uh, <laughs> so the funnest thought, 93 miles an hour you've ever done, I'm sure. Yeah, it was. It was no, go on, go on, go on, go on. Sorry, no, no, my little guy, young son. No. Um, so, it, but then we we got the bug and realized this is this is amazing and uh, uh, bought a uh, Kawasaki ZX14, and that thing has gotten progressively more modified uh, to the point now where it's turbocharged and ceramic wheel bearings and a fully hand built aluminum aerodynamic fairing, and uh, we set a record in 2013 mm-hmm. in a class class record. And then, uh, and then again in 2016, um, and then we actually built a side a bike for a sidecar record as well at one point. Um, so we're just, nice. we're just, we take everything out there to so two strokes, to big turbocharged four cylinders, to sidecars. Yeah. Let's just see how fast it'll go. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're just having, it's just an amazing group of people. And I, I think a lot of people don't really get the connection between land speed racing and desert racing. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you think of Mickey Thompson and then you go, Oh <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> a little, a, a little more direct connect there. The, uh, and it, you know, it's kind of crazy. Like I, I know what you're saying on the, on the bikes, like the ZX 14 and, and building it up. And my only experience with that and seeing that stuff is, uh, when I worked at San Diego BMW motorcycles, they had, uh, Aaron Sills there yeah. on the S 1000. And it's crazy how much goes into those bikes. All these little things, like you're saying, like ceramic wheel bearings. I mean, everybody at yeah. home's going, huh? <laughs> you know. but, yeah, I just uh, I just got Erin and uh, her boyfriend Trevor to come down to the Mexico 1000 uh, last year. Nice. Yeah, and, and Trevor ran it. He had a blast, I think. Nice. Oh, you know what? That's right. He did, uh, because at one point we were even talking about, he wanted to do like the 1200 GS, I think. He wanted to do a rally on it. Yeah. I'm like, uh. <laughs> yeah, and he's, he's a good rider, but man, uh, I don't know. I don't want to ever pick one of those up in a silk yeah. bed. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, you got, it's a coin toss, um, because yeah. y- you have to cross your fingers that the cylinder head lands on something solid <laughs> and keeps the bike up at about 40, 40 some odd degrees. Exactly. But Murphy's law dictates that it will always land in a rut. So you'll have to pick it up from flat. Yeah. I'm never that lucky. I always drop it all the way, <laughs> all the way down <laughs> and facing downhill. So you got to drag it and, you know, yep. So interesting. So where's the, uh, the, the 100 GS you still have it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nice. I bought it. I bought it brand new in, uh, uh, 1989 and, uh, it's got 92,000 miles on it. I still got it. Nice keep it forever yeah those old bikes are awesome from bmw they had they had some really cool stuff i, I always remember was it uh Sabine, uh running those at the dakar where the oh yeah the seat yeah. is just below his chest <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know that's awesome those bikes are, are pretty fast yeah they can get up and go it's so bomb proof yeah. Yeah. I mean, they are, I mean, it's like the Volkswagen. If you, if you build it right, it will literally run forever with whatever you choose to put for motor oil in it. Yeah. So. Yeah. I was always, a, I was a big fan of, um, Gaston Rye. Yeah. Such a tiny little guy. And he rode that thing, you know, to win the Dakar. Yeah. That's who it was. I don't know why I was thinking Pierre. It's to be, it was, uh, Gaston. That's right. Yeah. He Gaston had, I, Rye, um, he had and, to have uh, people start the bike for him, I think. Yeah, he had to start it by standing next to it and then like put his foot on the peg and then swing his leg over because, yeah. <laughs> and even you, you to Kleinschmidt before she went to cars actually ran, uh, ran one in the Dakar. Nice. Yeah. That is, uh, yeah. The bikes is a whole nother deal at the Dakar. Yeah. I, I don't, you know, whichever class you decide to run and, you know, obviously, especially the, uh, the Malamoto guys, you know, that's a whole nother breed of crazy, but you know. Mm-hmm. still uh it's still interesting to see and i think the older bikes i think were the were the uh, 
I don't know. I, I think it was funner to watch the older bikes because they were just these big, gnarly, you know, huge, not motocross bikes, tons of horsepower, zero suspension. Yeah. Comparatively speaking. So, yeah. So we'll see. I, I think we're, I think we're getting close with Yamaha doing their thing now with the Tenere 700 at some of the rallies. I think, uh, I think we might be getting close to seeing some big bikes back. Yeah. I think it's going to, I think it's going to promote a change. I don't see how it can't, it can't, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I mean, yeah, the safety thing and all of that stuff, but you know, I, I feel like it's there, there's, there'll be some kind of way that they control that, but it would be cool to see the big bikes back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. So we'll, we'll see there. So Nora, um, I think, you. so what other off-road racing have you done? I mean, or where did we go from the salt flats after the salt flats? what did you choose to do next? Um, uh, I, I, we still had the, the Baja bug, you know, I, I wanted to get back to Baja and I couldn't really find, uh, a way to do it. I couldn't do the, the Baja 1000 because list, logistically it was just too challenging and I had no experience and no background. Mm-hmm. And I uh, just read an article about Baja Bound Adventures and Tim and Tim Morton and Jennifer Morton. And I was they were talking about doing tours down there. And there was a little sentence at the end of their their article. And they said, oh, they do race support. And uh, I work in healthcare in the emergency department. And one of my buddies is a paramedic. And we just had a horrendous day where, uh, you know, a, pass, a passenger or a patient had a bad outcome right in front of us. And I, I my buddy rode motorcycles and we had been talking about going to Baja. And I just walked up to him and I said, look. Baja Bound Adventures will get us bikes. If you go with me, I'll find a way to get it funded. Just go with me and let's do the Mexican 1000. And and uh, he went for it. And uh, we got in touch with Baja Bound Adventures and they prepped bikes for us. And we ended our, our first uh, uh, Mexican 1000 and we've been doing it ever since. Nice. And uh, yeah, we just, you know, we just had a fantastic experience that was, you know, nonstop adventure with, you know, a, a steep learning curve, but a fantastic experience from start to finish. Nice. And so, I mean, now, I mean, now as a veteran of the Mexican 1000 and, and, and the races, what do you, what are the things you enjoy on that event? I mean, what I've, I've never been to it, which I have to change that, but. Oh, um, I think first of all, they say it's the happiest race in the world. And I, I think that they really endeavor to make it a fun, enjoyable experience, Mm -hmm. even with the, the, you know, rivalry between the car guys and the bike guys, that's really good natured. Um, they make it safe. They make it easy to do. Um, it's well organized. You get a experience, uh, an off-road desert race in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. You get a stop every night. So if you're a little bit older or not so fit, uh, it, you get an opportunity to recover, just a chance to fix your bike. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty well thought out. Nice. So the, the, the scenery is spectacular. You get an opportunity to enjoy it every evening. Mm-hmm. Nice. So there's, I think that's kind of a, a cool thing. It, it takes some of that pressure off of like, okay, we're going to go literally, you know, pin it for 27 and a half hours to try right. and get to the bottom of the peninsula. And I, and I think if you don't live in Southern California or other places with available deserts, it's hard to get that kind of experience mm-hmm. to, you know, if you have aspirations to enter the Baja 500 or Baja 1000, you, you, there's nowhere to really learn that craft. Gotcha. And I live in Colorado. We don't, you don't have that kind of distances and the kind of terrain that you experience in Baja. So you have to get it where you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so breaking it up and doing that. And, and what's the, the bivouacs like, I mean, every hotel is everything kind of nice. Or what's the, yeah, t- typically it's motels every night. You, you can make it kind of as rudimentary as you want, but there's you know, Bay of LA lodging is always hard just because it's a small town, but otherwise it's pretty much hotels. It's there's, everybody with the bikes is is pretty much in the same place so there's a lot of camaraderie there's a lot of help from one another you know if you break down on the road and somebody comes up on you they're going to help you Mm -hmm. you know it's not not game face you know no i gotta make it to the next you know i can't spend any time here yeah right and and i think there's a there's a great deal of respect amongst the riders so they 
you know, you realize if somebody stops and helps you out, you don't just blow them off the, the road. You give them a chance to get their time back on you before you start out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we, we call those racer favors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. This miles for me, the next one probably be you or whatever, you know, however that works out, but yeah. Nice. And so seven, seven years total now, seven years, six years. Yeah, I think, I think this is seven. Yeah. I started in, uh, I think here, uh, 2000, uh, I can't remember now, man. I have to look at it. Um, yeah, I think this is my seventh one. Nice. Yeah. And okay. Yeah. 2016 was the first time I did it with, uh, Dominic beer who went back the next year and got second place in class. Nice. Yeah. So he got bit by the bug also. Oh yeah. Yeah, Baja's, totally. Baja is very expensive. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. Yeah. He's, he's, he's riding a, a Husky 501 now. <laughs> nice. The, so you've, you've done the peninsula a few times. What is your yeah. favorite area to ride in? Oh, wow. Uh, I think the area outside of Loretto. Yeah. Nice. I've, yeah, and, I've heard that one a couple times outside yeah. South or North. Uh, I, Oh, wow. I think South. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 they've all got their own. I, I, my least favorite is probably the beachside stuff mm -hmm. just because I think the, the shale and the rock is difficult to manipulate. And by the time you get there, you're usually tired. Um, <laughs> it's going into Loretto. If you, if you come into Loretto through the wash, that's just miserable because you're exhausted and that wash is hard to ride. If you're leaving and you go out through the wash, it's a little bit easier because you're fresh in the morning. And mm -hmm. nice, yeah. I've heard uh, yeah. I've heard a few uh, a few people say that that Loretto's uh, that that area and and south and and then getting further south and then crossing over. Yeah, because uh, I, I like coming through the pine forest. I think that's a whole uniquely different experience, a different kind of riding. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's. Baja is so unique. Everywhere you go is so different that you, you just get uh, to use a different skill set, a little different scenery. Mm -hmm. It's always spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's always there's always something to look and stop around, you know, stop and look around and, and kind of take in and uh, or yeah. roads. I'm I'm a big fan of Catavina in that area. Mm -hmm. Um, just because the remoteness of it. And I mean, I know the other areas are remote, but like, I mean, literally like you could pull your cell phone out and you're not going to get a signal. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, but, uh, and the sunsets, of course, always, uh, sunsets in Baja are a little different than, than up here. Yeah, for sure. For and sure. I it just, the Mexican people are just, uh, nothing like you hear in the media. No, you know, nothing like it. Yeah, it's very, some of the nicest people in the world. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You stop in like, well, well, when we do the adventure rides and stuff like that, you know, we definitely get, uh, you, you get to interact with the locals and, you know, you, because it's business as usual for them when it's race time, they know to kind of stay, you know, they stay home. They, they kind of do their thing and, and know to yeah. avoid the traffic. But when you're down there on your regular adventure rides, you know, you get to interact with a lot of people and, and everybody's really cool. And, you know, they're, they're willing to help. And, you know, and it's like, it's very different. It's, it's humbling and it's nice. It's, it's nice to get out of the rat race, you know, where yeah. stateside. The, um, yeah, I did one adventure ride down through Baja and it was the same thing. People, if we, if we were stopped by the side of the road, would stop and ask us if we were okay or if we needed anything or, yeah. Just, nice. Yeah, that's it, it's it's refreshing. It kind of brings it home a little bit, you know, and you're like, OK, well, you know, at least not, you know, people aren't looking at you angrily and, and you know, throwing stuff at you and, and not rowdy and all this stuff that you see. Unfortunately, that you see a lot of attention drawn to in a lot of the race movies and, and coverage and stuff like that. You know, the, the unruly fans and, and things like that. While right. there are, while there's some that are not, but, you know, they of course, they want to see the action or, you know, however you want right. That's one of the things I enjoy about the Nora is they have a finish every evening in every town that you're in. And the, the fans are just there to, to see the racers and cheer you on. And they're not, they're not crowding out the course and trying to get in your way. They're just, they're, they're just not so rabid. <laughs> Let's just say. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's cool. I mean, you know, you get that finish line feeling every day, which is awesome. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, speaking about adventure bikes, so mm-hmm. you've done a couple of rides. Yep. Uh, yep. KLR six fifty, I think, was one that uh, Jared mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. In um, two thousand and fifteen, I think I was. Um, I met a guy, Wayne Mitchell, mm-hmm. who was putting together a plan to ride um, contiguously from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, all the way to the tip of Argentina mm-hmm. in with no breaks, including crossing the Darien Gap, uh, which is the 100-mile stretch of jungle between Panama and Colombia mm-hmm. that a few people have crossed in the past, but there's no road there. Um, so um, I kind of contacted him and because I had heard about him from a family member and they said, oh, this guy likes motorcycles and he wants to drive to Argentina. And oh, yeah, yeah, right. Everybody wants to do that. And um, so I called him up and um, he's, he said, yeah, I'm, I want to have take all military veteran paratroopers uh, from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, all the way to Argentina. And I want to cross the Daring Gap. And I thought, OK, well, and I started listening to his pitch and he had um, um a lot of sponsorship support already. And he wanted to make a documentary film about it. And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a veteran and I'm a paratrooper. And he said, well, we're looking for a medic. And I said, well, I, I, I'm a medic and I'm working in medicine. And his plan was to leave Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, on November 11th, which is sub-zero cold for, you know, four hours of light, maybe. Um, and he wanted to use sidecars to carry enough gear to, to keep everybody alive in those kind of temperatures until they get to Oregon and then ditch the sidecars and continue on motorcycles. Mm-hmm. And at that point we had just fabricated a sidecar for a land speed record attempt and actually got the record. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, Petra beer, Dominic's wife and him actually rode that bike for us and, and set the record. Um, uh, so we, so we were like, well, we can, we can help you. We can fabricate, sidecars for you and he asked me if i was interested in going on the trip and my personal life was kind of in shambles at the time so it was like yeah i need a road trip so um met with him and mike east ham and rich doring the other three riders and uh seemed like they had a solid plan the reason for leaving in november is to try to get to the darien gap in the dry season because mm-hmm. um, otherwise it's just too muddy and rainy to cross um so we went down, uh, went, started in 2015, we went down and uh, scouted out the Darien Gap because you have to have a permit to cross it from the center front, the Panamanian Border Patrol Police. Mm-hmm. You have to meet with the Kuna Indians who actually own the land. And the only way you can cross it is to use Kuna Indian guides up to, up to the Colombian border and then former FARC rebel guides on the other side. So we got all that arranged. And then, uh, 2016, uh, rolled out of Prudhoe Bay, uh, with 20 below temperatures. Savage. <laughs> so brutal. Yeah. It was, it was completely ridiculous. Um, and, and I do not like sidecars at all. I think they take everything that's beautiful about motorcycles and just ruin it, but <laughs> you can only <laughs> lean gotta, one way. <laughs> Yeah, but if you got to carry enough gear to stay warm when it's 20 below, it makes good sense. Mm. And balancing on the ice, we had studded tires and you know all the stuff you need to to make them go on the snow. But um, yeah, it took um, made it all the way out of Alaska, all the way down to Oregon. Took the sidecars off, proceeded all the way down Baja Peninsula, crossed over into Mexico, through Central America to Panama. Um, and uh, entered the Darien Gap, uh, which is a two-day boat ride into the jungle before you can even start on the supposed trail. It's mm-hmm. a it's a path, single track at best. Um, and we dropped the clutch on one of the bikes, tenth of a mile in. Oh, shit. yeah, and um, <laughs> yeah, that was on uh, Rich Doring's bike, and and he was. Um, probably the least off-road experienced of the riders of all of us. And so he elected to turn around and walk back out, um, back to the boats and go back to Panama and get clutches and parts and fly it down to Columbia. So we abandoned his bike right there. Uh, Then um, 
day two, we lost the clutches on two other bikes. And so we just decided that we save the clutch on the third bike and just push them all the rest of the way. So we uh, dragged them, pulled them, pushed them for the remaining 80 miles, 90 miles, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, with the help of the guides, um, we had to you know, sling load them with ropes over some of the canyons in the jungle and through rivers. And it was 10 days of really exhausting work not riding motorcycles like yes yeah, pushing them around and and i mean yeah, yeah. the the, the w well before i said i was going to say on it was this on the klrs yep that was on klr 650s ah yeah so so since they're so nimble and light yeah you know and, so we uh, yeah. we got we got them back we got them down <laughs> wow. to the, the, the columbia side put them back on boats mm -hmm. essentially smuggled them into turbo columbia <laughs> yeah. and then spent a couple days there meeting with the authorities to discuss how we got into Columbia um, <laughs> and, and getting new clutches. And so we put new clutches in them and then uh, the remaining three of us um, drove the rest of the way down to Argentina. Yeah. Took nice. five months in all. Wow. Okay. I was going to say, yeah, that's that. I mean, it sounds like a journey, but you know how, yeah. How long was it? Damn, yeah. Five months. Yeah. I, I'm and still, we had, um, we had a, a, our camera crew was all combat cameramen as well. So all veterans as well. And we had a, uh, a van that followed us down, but then took the ferry around the Darien gap and linked up with us on the other side. So they filmed the whole thing mm -hmm. and, uh, it's supposed to come out, um, with Revzilla, I think, uh, next month. Nice. Yeah. Huh. I wonder, uh, I wonder where they're going to do the, the viewing on that. I wonder if it's, uh, I haven't heard yet. It's um, they're making some some editorial changes mm -hmm. to make it more in line with their clientele. I think. Yeah, they're, but, they're right. Yeah. Nice. But once they decide that, yeah, for sure, it'll be. Uh, I'll be excited. I'm stoked to see it on the big screen for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, that's not. Um, you know, there's. Uh, it's cool because we're we're used to the long way around, and then the long way down and, you know, Charlie and, and, um, yeah. You and, you and, uh, yeah. And seeing them and I mean, uh, and, and their adventures. So this though, I mean, this is obviously it's a little tougher than what they, you know, what they did. Uh, not, not to downplay what they did. It's a big achievement, but, uh, yeah. but still, I mean, yeah. Pushing, pushing a bike for 10 days, basically averaging 10 miles a day. Yeah, it was, that's it nuts. was, yeah, there was, that was, um, if I was ever to do it again, I wouldn't go through the gap again. There's no way. <laughs> we have right. officially checked that box, ladies and gentlemen, yes. and we will not be doing that again. <laughs> yeah, no, no, never, never again. And uh, I was, I, I thought it was funny. It was right after I bought my my R100 GS BMW, I ran into um, Helge Pedersen in Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. He was in a camera store, and he had his round the world bike with him. And I was like, yeah, I was kind of planning on doing some adventure trips at some point and I exchanged a few words with them and then you know years later ran into him at some BMW rally or something mm -hmm. but I had no idea because he he had done the gap by himself with some guides and I was like wow you're it that's I thought it was an achievement then now I have much more respect for his achievement now I was like wow that was that's huge yeah that's I I'm, <laughs> I'm still blown it so of all the bikes we went with the KLR 650. What was, what was the, uh, the deciding factor there? Oh, the sponsorship. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. Kawasaki, Kawasaki uh, graciously came through with the bikes and, uh, uh, we, I think we would have gone, it had, it came down to the wire with whatever we had. Um, you know, I, I probably would have taken, uh, something smaller and lighter and, and more off-road capable. Um, but since they came through with that and, and we had a lot of, of sponsorship support. Um, but that, that, that made a huge difference in having all the bikes be the same brand mm -hmm. and, and, you know, use the same spares. Um, you know, we, by the time we had gotten the bikes and got them prepared, we had a little bit of experience with working with them and riding them and it, it just made it so much easier. Nice. And, and the, the KLR 650 is, is a very capable bike. It's, 
it's it's not it's very capable <laughs> it's about it right it's not very exciting it's not awe inspiring but it will do everything you ask it to do i w- i would not take it to bar <laughs> to race but you could i suppose yeah well i you know i've always kind of seen that bike as like it's the 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 very entry level adventure bike but right. it's been the same bike for so many years that it's like the honda xr650r you know, right. you could travel into Baja and the likelihood is you're probably going to run around or run across one that you can yeah. bump parts off of and or uh, or it's just simply a tractor. I mean, it's it's yeah. the, the John Deere of motorcycles. I mean, pile it into something, whatever. I mean, it's it, everything just kind of works. It's not spectacular at any one thing, but it does everything. Right. I mean, we put them we took them from sub-zero cold in the arctic to fifteen thousand feet in the andes put sidecars on them drag them through the jungle and literally you know we, we yeah and we you know we burned out some clutches but yeah. we didn't have any failures nothing yeah which i mean yeah i mean that's uh obviously the bike wasn't designed to to be doing that and there's bikes that are for that but uh but if the clutch was the you know the major issue that's actually not bad at all no i mean yeah that was that was it yeah. um, how many miles total was it uh i think the actual trip down ended up being it's a little over nineteen thousand. but we had to turn around and go back up to buenos aires to to ship the camera van home and uh, ship everything back so i ended up doing almost twenty two thousand miles <laughs> in five months <laughs> yeah <laughs> Nice. Yeah, and then I came back and eight days later raced the Nora. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so saddle sore was a whole nother level. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It, it, so where did those bikes end up? Did you guys hang on to them? Did they end up in a museum? Uh, What's the Mike Mike Eastham uh, shipped his back to Alaska. Uh, Rich abandoned his in the Darien Gap, so I have no idea where that is. It's probably sitting next to that. Uh, oh, what's that? That car called? Uh, so there's a car that got abandoned there mm. that thing called I don't even remember it's probably just still sitting there i would imagine or they dragged it back to the village and made a generator out of it yeah. and uh the other two um we sold them basically on the black market in argentina gotcha yeah uh, i've i've heard of i've heard of that happening a few times like uh when i worked at bmw there was people that were coming down and they were like yeah you know it's it's like it's worth it to buy it and then sell it down there. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's more cost effective because then to ship it all the way back, it's like yeah. Yeah, I, it, it was with the kind of abuse we heaped on them. They were not. They they had almost no value left. Nah. They were. They, yeah, well, was, you know, twenty thousand in uh, <laughs> twenty thousand miles or twenty two thousand miles in five months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. The, wheel, the wheels were a little out of true. <laughs> <laughs> just slightly, you know, just slightly. Just yeah. look at the road. Don't look down. <laughs> yeah. The wobbling is the knob. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there, oil consumption was up a little bit as I remember too, but no, no failures anyway. <laughs> it's a, let's think of it as a auto oil changing system. Yeah. You don't actually have to do an oil change. It just kind of changes itself <laughs> <laughs> over the next service interval. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No bad days, no losses, no negatives. It's all positives. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and, and what is that like rest days? Well, you know what? I, I want to see the movie. Yeah. I don't, we don't want to talk about all of the details and all of that stuff. But this uh, there is. Was, it was pretty much it was pretty much riding every day. Um, there was a few times when we got some breaks, um, when we got to turbo Columbia and Cartagena, I think we laid up for like 10 days, waked on clutches and parts. And, um, and we, we laid up, uh, in Mexico on the beach just because someone who met us through Facebook had a, um, uh, a fantastic house right on the beach that they let us stay in for free. So it was like, wow, yeah, we're staying here for sure. <laughs> so um, we, the generosity of people on the trip was just amazing. Nice. I mean, the list of credits in the film is getting longer and longer and longer as we recollect people that we have to thank yeah. for just the kindness on the road. But that's that's amazing. 
And and how many? Uh, so how many riders there were? Four riders. Uh, four riders, and then we had uh, what, we, two primary cameramen who were there for the entire trip, mm-hmm. uh, and then two other cameramen who came in uh, at the beginning and the end. Gotcha. And then uh, uh, Lewis Brown, who drove the van for those guys. Okay. So. Nice. So definitely, uh, well, obviously an adventure that goes without say. Yeah, it was it was a spectacular opportunity. You know, I, I, I you know, road trip is sort of a traditional way to to get over the the breakup with the girlfriend. I think if the road trip takes you to Argentina, breakup's not really the right word. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting relationship. Yeah. <laughs> Lessons were learned. <laughs> Lessons were learned. <laughs> adventure was had. <laughs> adventure was had. There we go. Lessons learned, adventure had. Check. <laughs> well, that'll be on a t-shirt in an, <laughs> in another <Yep>. month. <laughs> yep. But I mean, yeah, you know, you're but you're right. I mean, it's uh getting out on the road and and just getting on a motorcycle and i mean needless to say i'm you know, like well i'm gonna go to the other tip of this you know of this land yeah. mass uh is, is definitely a good recipe to clear the head uh, yeah well the the whole concept of, and idea for the for the trip came uh wayne mitchell and mikey stan were both deployed to iraq together mm-hmm. and they were sitting around you know commiserating and trying to think what they were going to do after they got home from the war and they were like, well, let's, you know, take a motorcycle trip. And then it turned into, well, let's take a motorcycle trip the length of the Americas. And then, well, let's film it because we know all these combat camera guys. Let's make a movie. And and uh, I had, I did not serve with those guys, but I was in Afghanistan doing my own you know, service. Mm-hmm. And the opportunity came to join them. And I was like, yeah, this is this sounds cool. Yeah. You know, let's go, let's go see some stuff and do some stuff. Yeah. We're, we were not we all had difficulties in coming home and missed the adventure and the experience of, of, of having an adrenaline filled kind of uh, experience. Mm -hmm. And so this was a a really good opportunity to kind of get the same feeling. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously the remoteness and then, you know, your team, your crew, you know, everybody kind of working together and, and, you know, here's what you got to get done. Here's the accomplishment that needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely. And what was for you, like, what was the thing that, um, on that whole trip, I mean, 20, 22,000 miles worth of it. What was there something that stood out the most to you that you weren't expecting? Um, hmm, what I wasn't expecting, mm-hmm. uh, I, I was, I mean, I had read about it and I had heard about it and I had some sense of the vastness of Chile and Argentina. Mm-hmm. But when you get down there, it, it just defies description. Mm-hmm. And I I had it in my mind when we left Alaska. Okay, we'll get through. You know, you got to get out of Alaska on a motorcycle in the winter. Okay, fine. But Yukon Territory and British Columbia are huge. Mm-hmm. and just as cold as alaska oh. you know it, it was just like okay great we're at the border of alaska we're in canada yay and it's like it's not any warmer <laughs> <laughs> yeah for the record when it gets under 50 degrees i'm, I'm yeah. done riding <laughs> if the ambient temperature just standing there is 50 degrees i know it's going to be in the low 40s by the time you get going 75 so that's yeah. where i stop so negative 20? Yeah. No. Yeah, it was, right. I, I think um, I I had a sort of a lot of preconceived notions about the violence that was supposed to be present in uh, Central America mm-hmm. and, um, got, you know, was met with nothing but kindness. Mm. It was kind of like, well, wh- where is this? And then um, I remember really distinctly the border between, um, uh the border in Colombia and all the refugees from Venezuela, mm-hmm. there's thousands and thousands of people trying to get North because their economic situation was destroyed. Yeah. And I, I had read about the, the refugee situation, but it didn't really sink in, mm-hmm. but there's, you know, 
literally thousands of people at the border. Yeah. Trying to find work. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to relate or not relate to it, but just imagine. And it's like, it's one thing to see the four digits down on a piece of paper, Mm -hmm. 1000 or thousands. It's a whole nother one to literally drive up to somewhere and literally see that sea of people or, or that many people in, in such a small area. Yeah, we were we were trying to cross the border into Ecuador and trying to process our paperwork. And and, and we were standing in 10,000 people. And it was it was really uncomfortable because there was no way we could hide our wealth. Mm-hmm. There was no way. Yeah. And and at one point they. I think closed the immigration office and people were starting to get, we were had concerns that it w- they were going to riot. Mm-hmm. It was like, we kind of, we just kind of did what military people do. We kind of got in a circle and there was a pregnant woman there. So we just stood ar- in a circle around this pregnant woman while the crowd just kind of waxed and waned and, and vented a little bit. Nothing really came of it, but I think the people that were around us saw what we did Mm-hmm. And after that, they were offering us food, and it was like, well, wait a minute, we didn't do anything that we wouldn't do for any other person. Yeah. But it sort of went. They, I think, it changed their attitudes just by our posture, mm-hmm. what it was. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's crazy. I mean, it's you know to to think about it, and it's always the thing you you know here in mexico or or baja and all that stuff like you we know we know that there are dangers there and and you kind of know the lay of the land and you know hey you know what after this time of day you know hey, it's best to stay out of this area let them do their thing you know whatever it is but you could go years without running across any of that right you know and and so it, but you hear the news and it's like doomsday you know mm-hmm. don't you know you know, don't forget to untie your shoes or whatever, you know, all these little things and all these recommendations. So it's, it's tough to put it into perspective because right. all you're exposed to is like this violence and all this stuff that, you know, is like the, the sensationalist side of it. Right. You know, oh, yeah. showing every people, t- every time I go to the Nora, I'm asked, you know, aren't you afraid of, and I'm like, of what? <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm more afraid of uh, eating bad tacos than I am anything. <laughs> right. I'm like, there's, there's just as much violence in my town, you know, but I, I'm not involved in the, yeah. in the activities that, that tend to draw that, that you know, mm-hmm. tend to, tend to promote those activities. I'm, I mean, I'm hanging out with motorcycle guys who are, and girls who are generally pretty cool people. Well, and, and, and you hit the nail on the head. They're not involved in that, and they're not in the areas of that. And it's like, yeah. I mean, I've it's it was funny as being. I've I've had run-ins. I've had. I've met some people that I wouldn't have normally met. In a completely different environment, you know, from when I used to spend tons of time at the nightclubs as a DJ thinking that I would have ran into somebody that, you know, you question where, you, well, you don't want to ask where the money comes from. Right. That, and, and that never happened. But yet in my nine to five, I'm the day before the military shows up to take them away from the start line at the two fifty in San Felipe. I'm talking to the guy. Yeah. And it's like, he, so you never know where you're going to run across it. But that's the thing is that is not the prime. That's not the prevailing thing no. that it gets made out to be. No. And, and one of the things I enjoy the most about my experiences out of Bonneville at the, at the Bonneville motorcycle speed trials and, and at Nora is that I interact with people that I, I might walk by on the street and not even acknowledge mm-hmm. and have become my group, you know, some of my best friends. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we meet guys living off the back of their Harley Davidsons. Mm-hmm. You know, I meet kids who are less than half my age who are now friends of mine. Yeah. You know, but because of the, of our appearances, otherwise we wouldn't even speak to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that, and, so, and, and what a waste. True. You, you know, to miss that opportunity. Yeah. Well, you never know, like, you know, people's experience and, and what they've gone through where to get where they're at and, and what's shaped them into that person to be that they are now. 
Right. You know, and, and but you're very right. I mean, and that's the it, the cool part is is that the motorcycle is the common bond. You know. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And and uh, yeah, at Bonneville, for instance, we had father and son team just came into our pit area and said, "Wow, I really want to do this." And we're like, "Go for it." They're like, "Well, I don't have leathers or helmet." Oh, we got that. Oh, I got to see you prepped his bike, put numbers on it. Kid went out and had the, you know, a, a, he's coming back this year, had such a great experience. Nice. It's like, yeah, it's like, come on, do it. You know? Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> However and, fast it goes. <laughs> yeah. And it, I just, the same way at Nora, the first year I did it, it, my friend Dominic Beer and I went down and did it. And, and Tim Morton introduces us to Ricky Johnson because he's riding with us. And we're like, excuse me <laughs> <laughs> wait the the rick uh, you yeah. mean ricardo johnson right not <laughs> not yeah. ricky right <laughs> yeah no ricky the eight time yeah that Nash guy <laughs> yeah that guy. that guy you're like okay and then you're you know and the guy is this super gracious fantastic dude you know who's asking me questions about my life and i'm like how do you know about that yeah yeah but it's just that you know, and turned into, you know, and became just a, a good friend, yeah. you know? Well, you know, and it's interesting. Uh, I, I'm got a chance to be around him and, and just in the group that they were chatting at, uh, one of the Baja 500s, I think that my brother ran, mm -hmm. uh, and one of the razors. And what you said in exactly that is he literally like, you, you think, Oh my God, that's Ricky Johnson. That yeah. guy right now put him on a on a two fifty, and I will not catch him anywhere. Yeah, and but you're talking to him, and it's like you're just talking to anybody else. Yeah, it, it just did. You know, took interest in my life, and is you know, if I texted him right now, he'd probably answer. You yeah. know, <laughs> so, but well, it's it, it just like it, I, I uh, Dominic and I when we were racing. Um, we got caught by the cars, which is really, really unusual in Nora. But there was one section where we were going really slow mm -hmm. and we got caught by the cars and, um, gone, totally gone. <laughs> got, we, we got passed by someone who's, it does it doesn't matter what his name is. We'll leave it out. Anyway, he was, it, we got passed by one of the cars, the, the, the driver of which has a reputation for being n not particularly sportsmanlike, mm -hmm. but just backed off, gave us a, nice friendly pass good horn plenty of room and at the end of the race my buddy went up to him and said hey man just want to say thank you for you know the nice sportsman like pass and shook hands and stood there and talked to him spent a lot more time with him than he needed to and then afterwards in the hotel we saw him going out of his way to go get a hat for a local kid and they're like that's not the reputation that i've heard mm -hmm. you know this is a this is a good dude yeah. and it was like wait a minute, <laughs> this isn't, my experience was definitely different than, than what we'd been led to believe. Yeah. Was the, uh, was the car orange? <laughs> it may have been. Yes. Got it. Yeah. And, but there, but you know, then you go back and it's the same thing. Okay. Well, what do they want to promote? Do they want to promote this or do they want to promote that? Right. You and, know. and it, you know, it was just, it was for two brand new rookies in the desert. It was, it was kind of, it, it was take your breath away, awe inspiring. Like this guy's supposed to be such a Richard yeah. and, and, <laughs> and here he is. And here he is just being super gracious, clearly recognized that we were rookies, right? Cause we're dawdling along on this big wide road, but he took his time to go by us and he didn't have to, Yeah, you know, and then taking care of this kid, he went, I mean, way out of his way to go get this kid a hat. And, and and I know he didn't realize we were watching him. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's, uh, the interview question that changed my way in perspective of things is that, uh, the director, of one of the schools I worked at said, you know, what, before you go literally two feet out the door, he goes, one more question for you. And he goes, uh, what does integrity mean to you? Mm. And I was like, Oh man, deer in headlights. And the first thing that I rattled off was, it's basically, it's what you do when nobody's watching. Yeah. And that, and that's exactly it. So with nobody watching, no cameras, no nothing. It's like, who is that person when it doesn't matter to the rest of the world? Right. right. And when, and when the, the person you're interacting with 
can can give you no benefit, right? How do you treat them, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, the, those people are not going to get anything from me, but mm-hmm. they still treat me, you know, amazingly. Yeah, yeah. and that's I mean that, that's all the difference, but, you yeah. know. And that's I think that's the cool part about racing, and and I mean, I really now after talking to you, I'm really more motivated. Like I feel like I should have gone to the Nora event sooner than, than even considering it now, but just because of the whole like bivouac thing and, and exactly that, that camaraderie and everybody just hanging out because that's it at rally raids. That's what you experience. If you go to Sonora rally, you go to Baja rally. I'm mm-hmm. sure I haven't been to Kota yet. Uh, but that's usually the rally life in the bivouac. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. Cause I'm, you know, coming up. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> Well, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to, uh, touch base when you make it down to the other end of the peninsula yeah. <laughs> we'll yes. do after race report. <laughs> yeah, please. And if you get an opportunity, I would love to have you come, I would love to host you out at Bonneville. Yeah, that would be rad. And you know, it's funny. So when I worked at BMW, it was like, all right, you know, Gary's getting ready and Aaron's going to be here and they're getting the bike ready. And, and, you know, Trevor's there and everybody's there like, all right, we're rebuilding the motor. We're doing this. And, and there is some stuff in that bike. You know, just the, the, uh, Shane and everybody that works on that bike and all the things that go together just to make this thing go down the, the salt yep. fall an ass is amazing. But yeah, I just, we have, we I have a, chance. you think racing in, in the desert is expensive. Racing at Bonneville is it's ridiculous, but, but you need people who, uh, who, learn the skills they need to fabricate stuff themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we have a, you know, we have a, a land speed record holding bike. I mean, last year we didn't make a run under 200 miles an hour the whole week. Wow. Yeah. And that, and, and that takes some serious, I, I came from a, a place where uh, we used to build transmissions for cars and supercars and stuff like that. And that was the whole thing. 250. Everybody that called wanted to say, wanted to tell me about how they were going to do 250 miles an hour in this car that they were building. And if we could gear it to that (laughs) and everybody, when Bugatti came out with that extra key, you know, to turn on the extra horsepower and everybody was going to put a switch in the car to give you extra horsepower. And they were going to have an economy mode, quote unquote. But a lot of people never realized what it took to get over 200 miles an hour. Oh no! Uh, we took our stock ZX14 out there the first time. I think it did 155. <laughs> That's a ways from 200. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, what did you guys? What What do you feel you guys changed that that made the 200 mile mark easier? Uh, uh, aerodynamics. Gotcha. Yeah. Not having to push the air. Yeah. yeah, that that was probably the biggest change. The turbocharger too. The turbocharger had a lot. And it's it's gotten progressively. We use uh, Dustin King in Arizona, who's uh, our, pretty much taken over all our engine management stuff now, and mm-hmm. that's made a huge difference because we were going through engines like every four runs for a while there. Uh, that's brutal. Speaking of expensive, because it's never yeah, going to be um, the easy one. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's expensive. It's and I don't I don't frightened easily but when that the last one went bang i was i pulled over on the emergency side because there was i thought if this catches fire we're gonna have i'm gonna have big problems because you're still doing way north of 100 yeah it's not something let me just step off yeah no or 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 let me lay it down yeah no and and nothing happened so i was fortunately that that's crazy we, we, have, we have had my my brother came off at 177 miles an hour on that bike oh yeah wow i, I imagine you slide for a long time yeah he, he tumbled for a bit yeah yeah but he's, he's fine now but, but he's fine yeah yeah i'm sure he still remembers it though yeah oh well, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's and i was gonna say there there's uh maybe you know it there Somebody had once told me there was like a ratio, like after, after 200 miles an hour, like every mile an hour requires so much more horsepower. Yeah. I do not remember exactly what the number is, but I mean, they uh, had it down to a science. Yeah, it is down to science, but, and 
it's in my experience, the friction on the salt is much better north of 200 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Um, but so the traction is so much more diminished too. It's, it's a little bit easier to push. It seems like it's easier to get it rolling, Mm -hmm. but you don't, you're not making any direction changes. Like nothing. No. And if you break traction, it's it's gone. You're it's just gone. You're not getting it back. So what I'm hearing is is that it's like basically at the line, you're pointing a dart. Yep. <laughs> and then you're just gonna throw this thing as hard as you can. <laughs> yeah, you have you have about typically about five miles to get it up to speed and then you're timed between mile five and six. Gotcha. So it's not, you don't need to have a, you know, a quick start or a drag race or burnout. You just got to get it rolling and not spin the rear wheel in five miles Mm -hmm. and get tucked in as tight as you can and then have it pinned and in top gear when you hit that timing. Mile five, the timing gate or whatever. And then you got to turn around and do it again, right? You have to come back the other way? Yeah, to get a record, if you set a record, you've got to go back on the frontage road to impound and have your bike sealed up and then they'll take you down to the other way and do it in the reverse direction to nullify any wind effect. Gotcha. Now this is how it's. And I mean, and that could be crazy because yeah, even in a few minutes, if the wind changes, you're, it's going to, yep. it's going to drown. And then they average the runs, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it doesn't take much to drop that average. No, no, I am. Um, I, the first time I did it, on my return run, I blew the motor at just at the end of the timing model. Ugh. Yeah. And, yeah. And so if you cleared the timing gate and then wind it down, it doesn't matter as long as you cleared the gate. Yep. Okay. Yeah. You, you've got, they give you like a three or four mile run out because nobody's running front brakes. Mm-hmm. So you, it takes a little while to get them slowed yeah. down. And which is, it's is almost as, takes also almost as much patience to slow it down as it takes to speed it up. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, you can, yeah, I can imagine you can't up, even sit up too fast to get a wobble and yeah. No, man. See, there's a whole nother dynamic to it that people that race off road yeah. would never, you know, never understand that or, or that race different disciplines because to be the yeah. best at each discipline, you have to know these little, these little intricacies. Yeah. And, and I, when I first started it, I thought, oh, you know, how hard could it be? It's a straight line. It's, you know, it's, how hard could it be? But you really have to ride every mile. Yeah. And, and it's just, it comes at you at such a different rate. Mm-hmm. You know, it's such, and it, Bonneville is pan flat, white, snow white. There's no real sense of perspective except for the flags, which are 90 feet apart width wise. Mm hmm. And then every quarter mile and it, you, trying to get that bike between those flags that are 90 feet apart is, is hard. And then when you come back on the frontage road, mm-hmm. you're, you're 11 miles away from the pit area. So you're just riding your bike back and you, you know, you're sitting up and you wave to the volunteers as you go by. And then you suddenly realize I'm doing 175 miles an hour. <laughs> you, can't go in, you can't go into the pit area at 170. You got, you know, you're, you know, fifth gear mm-hmm. rolling along. It does, there's no sense of speed, really. You're like, oh, I really got comes down. <laughs> <laughs> and time to rope it in. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. And then that's that. Uh, I, I've heard some of the conversations and they do that, but it's like, like you said, is not, not spinning the tires, which is still mm-hmm. a slick for the most part, if yep. not a slick. And then. And then the, also the, like the drive, right. You got to drive that bike all the way through to the last, I mean, the last inch of that timing section. Yeah. To make and sure they're so, it. they're so aerodynamically efficient from the front that if you get any side wind, you, you've got to keep it on the course and, and any side wind would tend to blow you off the side pretty rapidly. Yeah. Pretty significantly even. Yeah, I was going to say, because, yeah, from left to when you're looking at the bike standing on the sides after aerodynamics, there's not much room for wind. I mean, it's literally like a board. Yeah. You know, it's only aerodynamic on one edge. Yep. <laughs> the, the rest of it is not meant to go fast. <laughs> yeah. And it, there's been some, yeah, it's, it, there's quite a lot of science that goes into it for certain. 
And everybody's got, again, they everybody's got their opinion on how to do it. Mm-hmm. Yes, wait. Yeah, all the secrets. Nice. Well, yeah. We're definitely gotta get uh, gotta go. So okay, so we got two more items added to the list: Bonneville and uh, and the Nora race. Yeah, please. Yeah, I think that'd be <laughs> a lot of a lot of fun. Any, any of your listeners there? Yeah, Just look look for the Edwards Racing Pit and be like, "Hey, I heard you," and they'll be like, "Come yeah. on in." We come on down. We pick up we pick up all the strays. Uh, okay, but before we even commit to that, does the couch still go? Oh yeah, full blown <laughs> leather couch. <laughs> We have a full blown, full size leather couch. We have a full blown grill. Um, we bring like seven to ten coolers. Um, you know, a, a bunch. You know, sixty feet of shade. So we got easy ups covering the whole thing. And yeah, we 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 just that's that's a a big chunk of Bonneville is the best friends you get to see once a year. Yeah, just hang out and and you know what yeah. what have you been up to and. Yeah. And you, and it's the, it's the same thing we were talking about. You don't know if you're going to look up and meet some guy who's living off the back of his motorcycle or hosts a late night television show. (laughs) You'll be, you'll be sitting there with your jaw open going and you don't even ask them just they, cause they're too busy talking to you about your bike or, Mm -hmm. you know, and then next thing you know, you've had an entire conversation with these people and they're, they really appreciate just being treated like people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about a bike on a salt flat. Yep. That's it. Yeah. You know, that's crazy. I want, I wonder if we'll get, uh, I wonder if we'll get Elon out there in a model S plaid one of these days, <laughs> see how fast it'll go down the salt. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd try it for sure. Yeah, I know. Right. It could be fun. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think I think the most intimidating thing about the plaids is, is when they they get into launch mode, uh, they the front ducks down to the ground as you're mm. sitting in it. So mm. I, I, could be interesting. I don't know. We'll yeah. see. Nice. All right. Well, I know it's getting uh, it's getting close to dinner time, and I still got two bikes that I got to finish up before the weekend. Uh, I'm gonna. I wonder uh, if anybody. I w- you don't think they'll be showing this at the Revzilla event coming up this weekend? In, uh, uh, probably, probably not. I have okay. I, there. The anticipated release date is or completion date for the editing that they're doing, I think is middle of May. Okay. Gotcha. So, so yeah, one of the reasons I mentioned it to you, cause I thought they, that, uh, I don't know if you know Spencer out there. He's their media guy. Oh, okay. No, yeah. uh, just getting familiar with that crew. Yeah. So they're, they're kind of, uh, they took an interest in the project and and are are now going to be distributing it. And that's basically a extent of my knowledge of what they're doing at the moment. That's but awesome. I know that they're full speed ahead trying to get it done for May. So nice, nice. Yeah, that'll be yeah. the summer the summer movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. Have you seen uh, Have you seen the movie Out of Nothing? No. Oh, it's on Amazon. Got to look at that. All right. I'm literally going to add it right now. Yep. I will, I will check it out. Yeah. The opening, the opening crash scene is my land speed bike. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Damn. sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Is that the, what you were mentioning about your brother? Yep. Was that his him. crash? Oh, yep. wow. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm going to definitely check it out. Yeah. I've been, I, I just started watching the MotoGP uh, series. Like how they have the Formula One uh, version of it, uh, Drive to Survive. Yeah, they, they have the one for MotoGP. I had no idea existed, and so now I'm 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 watching that. And, uh, but yeah, I'll I'll add that. So out of nothing. Yep, out of nothing. Okay, and that's all land speed stuff. It's all land speed stuff. It's basically four guys from the Pacific Northwest building super radical bikes in their garage and going out and setting some records. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to see that because, yeah, there's some. It's like uh, we could compare it to the Honda Civics that you see racing down the street. There's not a lot. You open a catalog and you can make a a, a 15 second car, whatever they're down to now. But to get a motorcycle, though, to do that is not easy. There's there's a lot that goes behind it. So these guys, these guys are building lay down design bikes. Oh, wow. Because the the frontal area is. Yeah, much smaller. The size of your head and your shoulders, not your chest. 
Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. Go 300 miles an hour at six inches off the ground. That feels safe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you for the tip. I'll have to add that, uh, or I will add that to the uh, to the list of movies to watch or, or series to watch. I, I think you'll be very pleased. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Always looking. I mean, there's so many things to watch on those on all the now Hulu, Amazon Prime, Netflix, and HBO Max, and all those. Other shit. It's good to get recommendations. Yeah. So nice. All right, sir. Well, I appreciate you uh, jumping on the jumping on the horn with us and uh, sharing your yeah, stories. Thanks, yeah, Victor, thank you very much. I yeah. look forward to meeting you. Yeah, absolutely. So if it's not at Nora, it's going to be in uh, Bonneville. Yes. Yeah, or the Kota, the Kota Rally. Or Kota Rally, yes. Yeah, yeah. I got to I gotta get, man, the calendar filled up so fast for this year. But I, I talked to Mike out there and Jared and everybody, uh, Billy and all the guys that participated in the event. And uh, everybody was just super stoked on it. And so I'm, I'm happy that Mike's doing what he's doing. And uh, I'm glad that we're back a second year. He's back a second year. Yeah, I I, uh, I met with him and talked to him, and uh, I'm in, I'm in already. So nice. my first my first Mali Moto. So oh, there we go. Like I said, win or learn, you know. Yeah, so. Exactly. <laughs> nice. All right, sir. Well, you have a good evening, and I appreciate you jumping on. And we'll uh, I'll send you uh, I'll send you links as soon as this thing hits the ground. And we'll get, Pleasure. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You're right. Bye. All right. See you. Bye. All right, so there you have it. That was Simon Edwards of Bonneville and Nora and now Rally Racer and all sorts of stuff going on. I mean, this this is really cool. So uh, mutual friend Jared, uh, who I met in, in in talking about the Kota thing and online, and he's been following Chasing Waypoints for a while now and, uh, you know, gives me feedback. And, and we chat every once in a while, and we were talking a lot about Kota and how that went down and he, he sent me a message. He's like, Hey, you got to talk about the Nora 1000. I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, now Nora 1000, like he said, is, is road books, uh, road books now. And so it, that's a big transition, a big change. So now you have this going on. Um, and then he said, Hey, I have somebody that you should talk to that's been doing this for a while and, and, and has a bunch of cool stories. And, and, you know, uh, like for instance, pushing a KLR 650, uh, a hundred miles across the Darien gap. Um, is crazy. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that movie when it comes out. I think it's going to be really interesting uh, to see that. We love that stuff. I mean, you know, we, like I said, we, you know, we've seen the long way around, we've seen the long way down. We've seen those, uh, those movies uh, long way up. I haven't seen yet, but you know, it's out there. Um, and so all of these adventure type things like this, and, and especially having him involved in that. And then, you know, somebody that you could meet in Bonneville or you can meet at the Nora 1000 and, and not even know who you're talking to. And so Simon's a bunch of great uh, experience and things that he's done. And so I'm glad he was able to share a little bit of time with us here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting some uh, get some more insight uh, on this event, on the Nora and, and all of that. So with that being said, man, we are hour 23 minutes into this episode. So this one turned into a long one, uh, but definitely some great stories and then definitely some more to share. So. Let's see. All right. So what do we got coming up? We've got Waypoint Wednesdays coming up. I'm going to probably post some videos. So if you guys are tuning in and looking forward to Waypoint Wednesdays on YouTube, uh, probably going to find some stuff on uh, Instagram for that one. So if you guys want to check it out, definitely jump on that side of it. Uh, We'll be doing some Instagram stuff for it uh, because, well, we got a lot going on for this, uh, Revzilla event, but we're going to have a lot of updates, uh, from the Revzilla event. I'm looking forward to that, doing some riding, doing some classes. Uh, Travis from every single Sunday today sent me the itinerary and what they got going on. And it is stacked. There is a bunch of stuff going on. So there's going to be a lot to see. So I'm looking forward to finding out a little bit more and hanging out with some people, meeting some people, uh, see the fabled, uh, Zachar compound, uh, from Rawhide Adventures as well. So a lot to see, lots going on. So hopefully we can get you guys some, uh, some coverage. So if you guys are wherever you're tuning in from around the world, uh, now we are 65 countries and counting, uh, wherever you're tuning in from the world, make sure you're following at chasing waypoints on Instagram. I'll be posting the updates there. Uh, so you guys can check it out, uh, and see what's going on on this side of the globe. Uh, or if you're in the Southern California area and want to see what it was about, you'll be able to see that there. So 
anyway, with that being said, guys, I hope everything is is well. Everybody is out riding as uh, we get into the summer months here in the West Coast. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing some more adventure bikes and stuff like that riding around and and doing that. So anyway, with that being said, uh, we will see you guys for the next episode. All right, that is a wrap for the Chasing Waypoints podcast this week. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you like what you heard. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and a bunch of others. Also, follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook under Chasing Waypoints, Instagram, Chasing Waypoints underscore official, and of course, the YouTube under Chasing Waypoints. Hope everybody has a good week. We will see you guys for the next episode. Remember, shiny side up. And don't forget to tag us. We want to see where you guys are riding and what you guys are up to. Have a great week. Bye.